Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Schieffer. Well, what about that trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11? The government was going to try him in a civilian court not far from Ground Zero in Manhattan. Then suddenly, the mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, reverses his position, says maybe not try him there. Maybe another place would be better. The White House tells the Justice Department, check it out. Maybe someplace else would be better. We're going to talk about that with Geneve Montri from Amnesty International, Jan Crawford, our CBS News legal correspondent, and David Sanger of the New York Times. Uh, Geneve, I'm going to just ask you first, why does Amnesty International think it's important that he be tried in a civilian court? I think one of the most important things is that what we're really facing is, is, is a war of ideas. And what we need to show is both the American people and the world that the threat that we face is really not going to be won by bombs and bullets. It's really going to be won by, by the values we have and the laws we have. And the best place to explain that is right here. It's the right at the scene of, of ground zero. Jan Crawford, uh, your credentials on being against torture and things like that are pretty good. You, you were the one who uh, wrote, uh, did that uh, very important story of, uh, of revealing that members of the Bush cabinet actually met in the White House. and signed off on what kind of interrogation should be needed. It led to congressional hearings. But I also know that you have some real concerns about these civilian trials and trying these people in civilian courts. What's the other side? Of what? Well, I think what we've seen from some of the critics of this proposal is that it's a little late in the game to start bringing these guys to New York for a federal criminal trial. It'd be one thing if you started this out, you know, from the beginning, but after being held in Guantanamo now for seven years, no access to a lawyer, uh, waterboarded nearly a hundred times, you know, there's going to be a whole panoply of constitutional protect procedural arguments that they're going to be able to make. They're going to be in a federal criminal trial, just like a drug dealer who kills somebody in a street corner would. So they're going to have motions for outrageous government misconduct that they can file, speedy trial act motions. And so the the danger is, if the judge doesn't grant that, it waters down the system of protections for every American. It, it perverts, in some ways, our system of justice. Now, the Attorney General has taken the position that failure is not an option, that these cases must be won. So, at some level, you think, well, okay, is this a show trial or is this a real trial? Because at the end of the day, even if you give these guys all of these procedural protections and a judge does decide look, this is outrageous and we're going to have to dismiss them. The Attorney General and the White House is taking a position that even if they're acquitted, they're going to hold them indefinitely. So at some level, that whole idea of indefinite detention after these trials take place, I think make the critics say, why are we doing this? Well, What's isn't the that point a pretty good it? point, Jeanette? Because basically it's what old Judge Roy Bean in law west of the Pecos used to be. Give them a good trial and then hang them. Isn't that what the government's saying here? I'm afraid that the climate that we've created <laughs> is pretty much done. Done, done those things. I think the sad thing is that we really need to make up our minds. Are we going to fight terror with, with law and order and values, or are we going to try and have a domestic political debate? And unfortunately, what we have is a domestic political debate which is infusing every single rational aspect of, the, of this conversation. David Sanger, uh, all of a sudden, the mayor of New York totally reverses course. He was the one, one of those who said, we ought to do this in New York. New York can handle this. Now he's saying it's going to cost a lot of money. Right. He's calling the White House, say, find another place. What's going on with the mayor? Well, funny that a price tag sort of changes one's view of this. And some of the discussion has been that it could cost up to $200 million in a time that New and York... what? On, on putting the police out, you know, and also cutting off so much of an area around the federal courthouse of New York, which is, of course, one of the big, biggest and most commercially uh, important areas of the city that you could imagine between police overtime, lost business, you know, so forth, and who knows what numbers are right. But there's also a, a foreign policy issue here that I think President Obama has been uh, quite concerned about. Let's set aside for a moment the question of whether or not it would be a show trial and he'd detain them even if they were acquitted. And I think that's true whether it's in a civilian court in New York or whether you did this as a military tribunal and did it back at, at Guantanamo Bay. The issue that I think President Obama is most concerned about is that the rest of the world sees that the United States handles these things as an open trial with full defenses given to the defendant, that the evidence is presented in a public forum. Exactly what wouldn't happen 
in almost any of the states that the main suspects have come out of. And I think that's what he's most concerned about. To tell you the truth, I think if you're in the White House, whether you hold that in Manhattan or you hold that at a supermax prison in the middle of Colorado or you hold that at some uh, military base in the continental United States but still have a civilian trial, probably doesn't mean that much abroad but having a civilian trial may. Uh, you know, Jan, you bring up a very interesting point, and, and that is you're going to bring someone into this court who's been held for all these years. For a long time, he had no access to a lawyer. He literally was tortured. But you're going to bring him to court and say, yes, you can still bring him to trial in our civilian court. Does that mean if the government arrests me and I get tortured and I don't get access to a lawyer that they can put me on trial in this country? and? And suddenly the rights I thought I have, I don't have anymore. Well, I Because I couldn't, I couldn't my, argue, my uh, lawyer argue, hey, you know, you waived all that for this guy. Why not for old Bob? Well, I think that's a real concern with the unique nature of bringing these guys in now after seven years of being held without charges in Guantanamo and then putting, in, putting them in the military commission's, you know, process. Because they're going to file, like I said, motions for, say, outrageous government misconduct. And if the judge says, no, that's okay. Well, what does that mean for that motion in any other trial? If that's not outrageous government misconduct, the way they were treated down at Guantanamo, then what is? I mean, where do those motions go? What well, does that mean for our entire criminal justice system? So I think that's one serious concern. I, I mean, it seems These to are me, not technicalities, again. Yeah. I mean, to see people say, oh, well, they're not going to get mis dismissed on a technicality. These are constitutional protections that he's now entitled to. I, I think, uh, you know, why is it that we don't see civil libertarians making that argument? You know, because when you, when you look back, and part of, the, part of the problem is that we've had this really strange and tortured history over the last eight years of how these people ended up. You look at how many people that we apprehended who were bought on the basis of a bounty or some mistake, people who should never have been in Guantanamo, and we frankly don't have the information. You don't have the information of who these people are, how they ended up there. And frankly, we're still trying to search for our way out. And part of that is, is federal trials. Some people have advocated for, for military commissions. Unfortunately, they've all collapsed. That time has come and gone. We've had time and time again these people have been tried. So what do you do now? Well, uh, what you know, do you do with these people? Well, I think one of the things that you have to do is you've got over 100 people who have been cleared for release. They present no threat to the United States, over 100. And you know, Dan Fried and other people have been trying to go to Europe and other places to try and find a home for these people. But you aren't going to secure the United States by finding people who patently have no, present no threat to the United States and try to maintain an unjust system and keep them in Guantanamo. There are some people that clearly present a huge threat to the United States. The best place to show that these, police, th these people present a threat is in a, is, a, is in a federal court. Because those courts have worked, have worked time and time again. 198 cases, I think, have been brought in court. The idea that Shoe Bomber, Richard Reed, endless other people, the people from the 1993 bombing, were not convicted well. Is, 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 I think, a mistake. Also, the best investigators we have are in the FBI. They're not in the intelligence community. They're not in other places. They're people with inherent beat cop mentalities and a beat cop sense of how to investigate something. They can bring a prosecution. They've done it time and time again. We need to rely on the things that make, make America great and strong and not be, no, not, not be scared. Uh, David, you gave some of the reasons why the mayor of New York is suddenly a reverse course. I, I would offer another theory. I think we may be now living in the age of miracles. And the chief miracle maker seems to be Scott Brown, who won that Senate race up there in Massachusetts. Every time he mentions something, uh -huh. things happen, things explode, people change their position. He said, you know, this is not the right way to go, and suddenly every politician uh, seems to be uh, uh, coming around to that. You've got liberals like Dianne Feinstein from California now saying maybe it's not a good idea to do this in uh, California. Well, I think that, think that, that could in? well that could well explain Diane Feinstein and other members of the Senate. I don't think it explains Mayor Bloomberg, who just won re-election, not by much, on an extended term for which he cannot run again. So I think that his political motivation may be a, a little bit less. At the same time, look, holding this in New York City, the city that is a major target for Al Qaeda, the city that they've tried to attack twice with varying degrees of success between 1993 and then 2001, uh, is in some ways waving the red flag. And you could imagine how if you moved it to a more secure facility in the middle of the country but still had a civilian trial, you might accomplish 
satisfying the problem that Mayor Bloomberg is addressing and satisfying the problem that we've been discussing here. Uh, let me ask all three of you quickly. Uh, does anybody at this table think that Guantanamo is going to be closed anytime soon? I don't think it's going to be closed soon, but I, I do think it will, th that the detention facility over time will be closed. Uh, some of the bigger problems they're running into, in addition to the issue of where to put the hundred, is that there are a bunch of Yemenis sitting there who nobody wants to send back to Yemen right now under mm -hmm. these conditions. So, you know, I think it could be, it could stretch out for years. No. Jan? No. I don't think Congress, and Congress, I mean, one thing that Congress does well is read polls. And so I don't think Congress is going to give the money to the White House to get these guys back up here in a federal prison somewhere, say, in Illinois. I've seen no evidence that the president is going to spend, you know, whatever political capital he's got left to hammer Congress and say, you know, you've got to bring these guys here to Illinois prison. You know, so with the president at the end of the day can just say, I tried, Congress has spoken, let's move on to health care. I think the sad part is that Guantanamo is a system. It's part of a system of keeping people without, without any legal overview. And if we just move them to Illinois or to another place, Gitmo's not going to close. It's really just, just going to move. And I think the saddest part is Gitmo has been a recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda all around the world. And we know that. And all we're doing is keeping those, those flames alive. Before we uh, stop, I want to talk to uh, David just a little bit about his book, The Inheritance, which uh, came out last year. And basically what this is, was a list of the things on the foreign policy front that the president was going to face in his first year in office. Well, he's been there for a year now. Right. Uh, you have done an update for the paperback version of this. Uh, do you give him any kind of grade, or how do you judge this first year on foreign policy for the president? Bob, what I say in the, uh, in the new edition is that he managed to change the tone of American foreign policy. You go around the world today, and you don't hear that innate anger at the United States in Europe, in uh, parts of the Middle East, his outreach to the Muslim world, the Cairo speech, even his willingness to engage Iran, even though it was not successful, uh, I think has won a change of view. What it has not accomplished is change the behavior of either our allies or our adversaries. Our allies are still very reluctant to give additional troops in Afghanistan. Uh, Iran, as I said, basically rejected the engagement effort and is now forcing President Obama into this sanctions position. The North Koreans were immune to Mr. Obama's many charms. Um, the Chinese were largely immune to it and gave him a pretty hard time on both uh, global warming issues and increasingly their unwillingness to go along with sanctions on Iran and North Korea. The fact of the matter is, <laughs> Perhaps our closest ally, Israel, uh, has not exactly gone down the line. That's right. I mean, you know, the president came in saying they had to give up uh, additional settlements in order to uh, begin the peace process. The Israelis said no, and the president's basically accepted that. So if 2009 was the year of change tone, 2010's got to be the year of performance. And it's particularly important because it doesn't look like he's going to get much done in Congress. So foreign policy being an area where he's got more latitude by himself, he's got to really deliver this year. He's got to deliver on energy and the environment. If Iran goes nuclear on his watch, it would not be a good thing. He's got to deliver with Pakistan. You know, he, the big underlying premise of putting American troops into Afghanistan was that the Pakistanis would come in on their side of the border and keep the Taliban from coming back over the border, exactly what happened to us in 2001. Well, now the Pakistanis say they're not going to be there for 6 to 12 months. All right. David, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks to both of you. And that is Washington Unplugged for this week. Don't forget to watch us on television Sunday on Face the Nation. We'll talk to Governors Haley Barber of Mississippi, Ed Rendell of Pennsylvania, and a cast of thousands. We'll see you there. Bye.